Hello again, everybody. In today's lesson, we're going to look at what happens when you fire a charged particle into an external magnetic field and how when you do that, the charged particle ends up being subjected to something called a magnetic deflecting force. And then we're going to look at the third hand rule, which is going to help us predict what direction this force is going to be. The learning outcome, as identified from the Physics 30 program of studies, is to explain qualitatively and quantitatively how a uniform magnetic field affects a moving electric charge using the relationships among charge, motion, field direction, and strength when motion and field directions are mutually perpendicular. All right, so let's set up the situation. On the diagram you see here, I have a couple of jumbo bar magnets. On the left-hand side, I have a north pole. On the right-hand side, I have a south pole. We know from the lesson on permanent magnets that field lines need to be directed out of the north and into the south. And if we're close to the center of those bar magnets, that field is roughly uniform. What we're going to do is we're going to take a charged particle, specifically a positively charged particle, and we're going to fire it into the page. The X rate there indicates you're firing it into the page. It's like you're firing an arrow and all we're seeing is the fletching of the arrow as it's moving away from us. Now, in this scenario here, you actually have two magnetic fields that are interacting. You have the magnetic field due to the jumbo bar magnets and you also have the magnetic field due to the moving positive charge, the electromagnet. And again, a moving charge produces its own magnetic field. When these two fields interact, it's going to result in the charged particle being deflected, uh, being subjected to something called a magnetic deflecting force. Now, we need some way to represent what the actual magnetic field looks like surrounding that moving charged particle. And we're going to make a pretty big assumption to do this. Imagine in, in the direction that we're firing that charged particle that we have a long straight current carrying wire that's being directed into the page. And because we're talking about a positive charge, a positive charge with our hand rules immediately means we're going to refer to the right hand. And positive charges is an indication that uh, if we're talking about a current carrying wire, we're talking about conventional current and not electron flow. So imagine right here that we have a straight current carrying wire that's being directed into the page. Now, if I asked you to draw the magnetic field line surrounding that, what we do is we would take our right hand and take our thumb and point the thumb in the direction of that uh, current or the direction the positive charge is moving. So your thumb would point into the page. You would then look at the curl of your fingers and the curl of your fingers would tell you what direction the magnetic field is surrounding this guy. So we'll use a circle to represent this. Maybe like a couple of circles here. And if I do this, thumb into the page, look at the curl of my fingers in my right hand, the curl of your finger should point in a direction that is clockwise. So we can represent it on the circle like this. So that's just a representation of what the magnetic field would be due to this moving positive charge. Now, I'm gonna make things a little bit strange here. I'm gonna pretend that at the very top of this loop right here, there's this imaginary bar magnet And I'm going to do the same thing at the very bottom. I'm going to pretend that there's this imaginary bar magnet at the very bottom of the, of the circular loop. What this imaginary bar magnet is going to do is it's just going to kind of represent like the polarity, I suppose, of like the magnetic field that is produced from that moving charge. And what I want to do right here is I want to identify which pole on this magnet's a north pole and which one's a south pole. Now we know magnetic field lines need to go into a south pole and they have to exit through a north pole. So they go into the south and they exit through a north pole. 
Now, I'm gonna make a pretty big assumption right here. I'm gonna assume that like the region of the greatest influence, maybe this isn't a huge assumption, it's probably like pretty realistic, but let's say the region of the greatest influence from the bar magnet is at the center. So we'll pretend the South Pole is entirely like concentrated here. And we'll pretend that the North Pole is entirely concentrated right there. Now, what I wanna do is I want to look at how does those little imaginary bar magnets interact with the jumbo bar magnets. And we can describe this interaction by talking about uh, uh, the law of magnetism. So like charges repel, opposite charges attract. If you look at the very top magnet right here, this North Pole right here would be attracted to this South Pole. So we could use a, rep a vector to represent the force of attraction. On the left-hand side right here, this South Pole would also be attracted to that North Pole. For this imaginary bar magnet at the bottom, this imaginary bar magnet at the bottom would repel from this South Pole, and it would also repel from the North Pole. Those four vectors in green right there represent what we call the magnetic deflecting force. Now, we just want to represent that with a single vector. And there's a couple of ways you can actually identify like what the net magnetic force vector would look like. So one way is I could break this into vector components where I just simply show this component having a Y component that points down, X component points towards the left, right here, Y component down, left, uh, X component points towards the right. And then here you'd have a Y component that points towards the right and sorry, X component that points towards the right and a Y component that points down. And then here you'd have an X component that points towards the left and a Y component that points down. Now let's look at what happens with these different components. Some of these components are going to cancel off. This X component points towards the left. This X component points towards the right. So these two X components right here, they just cancel each other off. So we can just ignore them now. On this diagram, this X component points towards the right. This X component points towards the left. So they also uh, cross off. So all I have now is I have four Y component vectors that all point straight down. And that tells me the magnetic deflecting force is actually going to be downward. Now, you could have done this a bit easier if you just used vector addition. Vector addition would be take those four angled vectors and add them together. So that'd be like vector one plus vector two plus vector three plus vector four. Here's where the vector starts. Here's where the vector finishes. And then the net direction would just be a vector that points from start to finish. Vector from start to finish would also point straight down. So the direction of the magnetic force would be a vector that points down. Now, if you are completely confused right now, I don't blame you. Like we, we made this pretty crazy assumption by assuming that the single positive charge was like a straight current carrying wire. And then we talked about some imaginary magnets representing the polarity of the moving charge. And then we drew all these vector components. It is a lot of work to figure out that the magnetic deflecting force is down. It turns out we are not going to use this procedure to figure out what direction the deflecting force is. We're going to use something called the third hand rule to do it. So the third hand rule can be used to predict what direction is the magnetic deflecting force. Now, 
here's where thing gets, things get a bit more complicated. We need to introduce another part of our hand to represent something. Now, when we deal with magnetism, we deal with vectors that are in kind of like a three-dimensional grid. So I'm just going to draw a three-dimensional grid uh, on this picture here. So let's say we have like a y-axis. And then we have an x-axis. And we have a, another direction, which is what I'm going to call a z-axis. So we have three different axes that represent uh, three different directions, all perpendicular to each other. Now, we can use our hand to actually model a three-dimensional grid. If you look at the picture right here, if I take all my fingers and I point my fingers all in one direction, <coughs> excuse me, all of my fingers right here, point in the direction of the x-axis. Now, what you want to do is when using the third hand rule is you want to try to keep your thumb as perpendicular to your fingers as possible. You need to you need to lock your thumb in place like this. Now, when I try to make my thumb perpendicular to my fingers, I, I, I can't do it. My, my finger, my thumb is not flexible enough to do it. I mean, ideally what you'd want right here is you'd want the person's thumb so it's like more like sticking out like that. In which case then the Z direction would be represented by the direction of their thumb. Now, the third part of the hand that we're going to introduce is we're going to introduce what direction is your open palm facing. So you open your palm and it's imagine like, I don't know, like a, a laser beam coming straight out of your palm. That's going to be the third direction. So there's a laser beam coming out of your palm right here. Your palm. That is the Y direction. So if you hold your, if you put, point your fingers all in the same direction, you try to make your thumb as perpendicular as possible, then you can have your fingers represent the X axis, your thumb, the Z axis, and your open palm represents the Y axis. It can be used to represent a three dimensional grid. Okay, we'll come back to this in a moment here, but let's talk about what the different parts of your hand are going to represent. Okay, so first things first. What you want to do is you want to take your fingers and you want to point them in the direction of the external magnetic field. The external magnetic field usually comes from something like a bunch of jumbo bar magnets like we saw in the previous slide. Your thumb is going to point in the direction that your particle is moving, the direction of the velocity of the particle. Now, whatever direction your open palm is, that is going to be the direction of the magnetic deflecting force. So let's go back to the previous slide now and see if we can use this to much uh, more quickly identify what the direction of the magnetic force is. <coughs> okay, so let's create a bit of an axis right here. So let's say that uh, I'm going to say this is the y-axis, this is the x-axis, the z-axis would be the one that's like coming out of the page or it's going into the page. Okay, so let's figure out what the different parts of my hand represent. The magnetic field, the external magnetic field, so write down external B, that's the direction of these lines here. So these lines are pointing towards the right. The right would be the positive x direction. You want to take your fingers and point them in this direction. So with your right hand, because we're dealing with a positive charge, You take your fingers and you point them towards the right side of your page or your computer screen, however you're looking at it right now. Now, 
you need to keep your thumb so it is as perpendicular to your fingers as possible. So uh, the direction of the particle's velocity, so that's going to be this guy right here. The direction of the particle's velocity is into the page. In this case right here, based on my, my three-dimensional grid, into the page would be the negative Z direction. And that's the direction we're going to point our thumb. So take your right hand, point your fingers towards the right side of the page, make sure your thumb is perpendicular to your fingers as best as you can. And you need to then rotate your wrist so that your thumb is then pointing into the page. Now, if you do this correctly, if you have like your fingers pointing towards the right, your thumb pointing into the page, your palm should be facing downward. So that's a direction of FM. So your uh, FM would be pointing downwards. I'm going to call it vertically downwards. Actually, that's not a good description here. Let's call it downwards for now. And I clarify three-dimensional notation a little bit later in the lesson here. Uh, okay, so it's downwards. And uh, downwards right here, according to the way I've drawn my little Cartesian grid, that would be the negative y direction. And that is the direction that your open palm should face. So once again, the way I would use this hand rule, and we'll go through this in an example in a second, is you take your right hand because it's a positive charge. Take your fingers and your thumb. Make sure they're perpendicular. Then take your fingers and point them in the direction of the external magnetic field. That's towards the right. Rotate your wrist. Your thumb can then point into the page. And then look at what direction your palm is facing. The direction your open palm is facing is the direction of the magnetic deflecting force. This is much faster to use than the explanation I gave involving like the imaginary magnets and assuming that the positively charged particle was a straight current carrying wire. So th this will speed things up quite a bit. Although it does take a bit of practice to kind of get used to how you need to manipulate your wrist and your hand to make this all work. So that's how we get the direction of the deflecting force. However, let's talk about the magnitude. Seems like it's been too long since you've actually looked at a mathematical equation in physics. To calculate the magnitude of the magnetic deflecting force, we have an equation that looks like this right here. We have the absolute value of Fm is equal to Q, absolute value, V absolute value, B absolute value times sine theta. In this equation here, Q represents the magnitude or absolute value of the charge of the particle. So it doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative, we're just going to take the actual magnitude of it. V is the magnitude of your velocity, which is just the speed of the particle expressed in meters per second. We also want to express charge in units of coulombs. B represents the external magnetic field strength. So the variable we use for magnetic field is the variable B. Uh, I'm not totally sure why they choose the variable B for magnetic field strength, considering how in the phrase magnetic field strength, there is not a single letter B. From what I've been told, apparently, I'm not sure who the scientist was. I want to say Michael Faraday, but I think he wrote a paper and in the paper, he had a bunch of different variables he was using in equations. And the second variable he used in his paper in an equation was magnetic field strength. Because it was the second variable he used, he just called it the letter B because it's the second letter in the alphabet. And apparently that's stuck with us. I don't know if that's actually true or not. And really, who cares? Let's just use B for magnetic field strength and get over it. 
theta represents the angle between the velocity of your particle and the direction of the magnetic field. Now, a couple things about this here. So let's look at all the different situations that would result in you not having a magnetic deflecting force. So let's go look up at the equation right here. If Q is zero, this could be like firing a neutron through a magnetic field. If you fire a neutron through a magnetic field, it has no charge to it. Therefore, it would not be subjected to a magnetic deflecting force. Another way is if your charged particle is not moving. So I mentioned before that uh, this is like from the first lesson. If you have like a magnet here and you just put a stationary charged particle to the side of the magnet, the magnet doesn't do anything to the charged particle. The reason being is because it's not moving. It's not moving. There's no magnetic deflecting force. So it's not influenced. The other one's pretty obvious. If there's no external magnetic field, then it's not going to do anything. Now, the other one deals with theta. So theta represents the angle between the magnetic field lines and the velocity of the particle. So uh, let's look at like an example right here of what this might look like. So let's say that we had a magnetic field that's directed towards the right. So we'll call that B. Now, in order to get sine of theta equal to zero, that occurs when theta is zero degrees or 180 degrees. So if I drew the level, the, my particle here, my particle, if my particle was moving in a direction that either is the same direction of the magnetic field, or it's going in the reverse direction of the magnetic field, in the top case, they would be zero. The bottom case, they would be 180. In either situation, if you run along a magnetic field line, then the particle is not affected because theta is zero degrees. Now, ideally, what you'd want to do is you want to uh, maximize this magnetic deflecting force. The biggest value that sine of theta can be is 1. And that occurs when theta is 90 degrees. So ideally, we want the direction of the particle's velocity to be perpendicular to the magnetic field. So if I took a charged particle and I fired it in this direction right here, I'd have a 90 degree angle between the field lines and the velocity of the particle. So that would maximize the, 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 uh, that would maximize the magnetic deflecting force. If you fired it at an angle relative to the magnetic field, so let's say we put it like at an angle here. So uh, I think the, yeah, an angle right here. What the sine theta would do is a sine theta would just allow you to take the vertical component. So if you broke this into components, here's a vertical component. I shouldn't call it a vertical component, the component that is perpendicular to the field. So this would be like V perpendicular, and this would be V parallel. So it's only the perpendicular component of the particle's velocity that's going to uh, uh, contribute to the magnetic deflecting force. So that's what the sine theta thing does. It forces you to take the perpendicular component of that. Note here, just the unit combination for a Tesla. So that, that's what the uh, unit of measurement is for magnetic field strength, the Tesla. It's really ugly units that don't make a whole lot of sense if you try to interpret them. So you have one Tesla is equal to 1.0 kilograms divided by coulombs per second. You could uh, obtain these units here if you just did a unit analysis on the above equation. So on the above equation, FM has units of Newtons. Q has units of coulombs. Speed has units of meters per second and B as units of Tesla's and sine theta is just, a, it's, it's a ratio of uh, 
lengths of sides, which is just, it's unitless, so it doesn't contribute. A Newton, we know, is a kilogram times a meter per second squared. Now, I'm not going to show the actual manipulation for a Tesla here, but if you combine units and move things around, you could show that it is a kilogram divided by Coulomb times second. <coughs> okay. Uh, now, before I solve this example problem, I do just want to like clarify what the notation for vectors is in terms of how we need to express things moving forward. So I'm going to draw a picture with, uh, let's do purple. Okay, so let's say this is a sheet of paper on your desk. Okay, that's a sheet of paper on your desk. Now I'm gonna identify my different directions here. So with well, a direction that ports, points towards the top of your piece of paper, a direction that points towards the left side of your piece of paper, and a vector that points towards the right side, and another vector that points towards the bottom of your sheet of paper. Okay, if the vector points towards uh, the right of your paper, we say it points towards the right side of the page. Or it points in a compass direction that is east. If a vector points towards the left side of the page, that is going to be a compass direction that is west. If the vector points towards the top of your page, so we'll call this the top of the page, this is going to be a compass direction of north. If the vector points towards the bottom of the page, that's a vector that points towards the south. So if I drew my three-dimensional Cartesian grid here, so far I've accounted for, let's say this is y, we'll say that's x, that's z. We've accounted for two of these axes. We've accounted for the z-axis, that would be the axis that uh, the top of the page, the bottom of the page, north or south is along, and the x-axis would be the left side of the page or the right side of the page, west or east. So we still need to account for like the y direction. Now I'm going to draw, draw this one with a different color. Okay, so this is the y direction. Okay, if it comes out of the page, We call this vertically upward if the vector goes into the page we call this vertically downward. Now, you need to make a very careful distinction right here. So what I do not want you to do is we do not refer to the top of the page as being up and the bottom of the page as being down. It was okay to do that. We were talking about just vectors in two dimension, but now we have this third uh, direction to worry about. So the top of the page is north, the bottom of the page is south. If we say up, up means vertically upward. If you have your piece of paper flat on your desk, Vertically upward would mean that you're having an increase in height. You're coming out of the page. If you say down, that means vertically downward, which means you'd have a decrease in height. So you'd be going towards the ground below your desk. 
that's into the page. So just be careful with like how we use this notation here moving forward in terms of identifying what up and down actually represents. Okay, so I'm just going to erase this now. And now let's get into the example. All right, so it says predict the direction the following charged particle will move when it enters the external magnetic field shown below. So first things first, this guy is a positively charged particle. So a positively charged particle means you need to use your right hand. The magnetic field direction between these two bar magnets right here will be out of the north. So we'll go out of the, out of the north. And into the south. And we'll draw a few of these vectors here. that represent the magnetic field. Okay, now uh, I'm gonna identify what all these different vectors represent. So first vector is the magnetic field. And that's the direction your fingers are going to point. Now looking at the picture right here, your fingers are pointing in a direction that is towards the top of the page or north. The velocity of the particle is represented by this vector. That's going to be the direction your thumb points. And your thumb points towards the right side of the page. Or east. And we want to figure out what's the direction of the magnetic deflecting force because that's going to tell me like what direction my particle is eventually going to move. That's what direction my open palm faces. So what I would do is first things first, take your right hand, take your thumb and your fingers and make sure they are perpendicular to each other as much as they can. So I start off by taking my fingers and I point my fingers towards the top of the page or north. Then you're going to have to potentially rotate your wrist so your fingers still point towards the top of the page but your thumb would then point towards the right side of the page now if you do this correctly your open palm should be facing towards your head now if it's facing towards your head it means that the vector is coming at you if it's coming at you it means that it is out of the page Or if it's coming out of the page, we say that it's vertically upwards, vertically upward. So what direction does the particle move? Well, that's the direction of the magnetic deflecting force. The direction of the magnetic deflecting force right here would be out of the page. Out of the page is represented by a little dot. It's as if the arrow is coming at you and the little circle there represents the arrowhead that's approaching you. So that's the direction the particle initially deflects. Now, it might take you a little while to kind of get used to the third hand rule. Uh, again, the biggest thing that you need to remember to do is when you are using the third hand rule, try to keep your thumb and your fingers perpendicular to each other. There's no curling of your fingers here. That's the second, uh, the second hand rule. Uh, and, uh, yeah, just uh, keep practicing it. And the assignment of magnetic forces, which you need to complete, will have uh, answers in brackets to clarify what direction the deflecting forces are. So hopefully you'll get enough practice and eventually figure it out. Talk to you later. Bye.